Would you guys go ahead and open with me to your, uh, in your copy of God's Word, the book of Revelation. It's probably just kind of like flopping over. Uh, we've been doing that since January. Uh, but as you're turning there, uh, I want to just kind of let you guys know, I, when I was assigned to preach this morning's text a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, um, I was really nervous about preaching it. I remember talking to my daughter, Cam, and telling her, I, like, I, 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 what, is, what is this text? I don't know anything about this text. You know, it's not unusual for me to get nervous about preaching, but I was just especially nervous this time. Uh, some of you might remember from the last time I preached, which was from Revelation 3, the letter to the church in Sardis, I had made a confession at the beginning of that message, something to the effect that I hadn't ever read the book of Revelation in its entirety, and how that probably wasn't the best thing to hear from someone who's about to preach a sermon to you from it. Um, in fact, after I preached that Sunday, uh, that, that following Tuesday afternoon in our staff meeting, Billy and I um, were sitting down talking about the message. He was giving me some feedback uh, on the sermon, and in particular, he was thanking me uh, for taking time at the beginning of that sermon to be transparent and honest with all of you about my lack of familiarity with the book of Revelation. And I remember him encouraging me to continue to lean into ways in the future sermons that should the Lord allow me to preach his word, uh, just to humble myself as I preach, to, to show, as, he, as Billy said, to show my clay feet or, or my weaknesses and how that will serve to remind both myself and to any of those that I'm preaching to that I'm no different. I'm, I'm just a, a man seeking to be faithful to God as I read and seek to understand and obey God's word. It was super encouraging feedback, so thank you for that, Billy. Uh, but then Billy did this little Groucho Marx eyebrow thingy that he does. I don't know if you guys have seen him do that before. But he's like, and let me now talk to you like a dad. <laughs> flipping his eyebrows up. He says, if you ever want to preach in this pulpit from Revelation again, you had better make sure you've read the whole book. <laughs> uh, so Billy, thank you for that. Much needed encouragement as well. And not that anyone who knows me needs more proof of my clay, fleet, my clay feet, uh, but I can now at least, in fact, say that I've read the entire book of Revelation uh, before preaching this morning. And it's a fascinating, strange sobering, faith-assuring book. Uh, and this morning we're going to be looking at chapter 10. So you can go ahead and turn to chapter 10. And up until a few weeks ago, honestly, I had never read chapter 10. Uh, I didn't have a clue what I was going to read when I was assigned to preach chapter 10, you know, much less what I would be preaching on from this chapter. And, and that was a little daunting. I mean, Revelation, it's just got weird stuff in it, doesn't it? Uh, even though I hadn't read the entire book, I had heard bits and pieces uh, just growing up in, in church, uh, sermons and such. And there's just some pretty wacky scenes in this book, especially in the later chapters with antichrists and beasts and a pregnant woman hiding in the wilderness from a dragon who wants to eat her kid. Just uh, Even Billy, just a couple of weeks ago, he we preached about locusts with Yoko Ono hairdos and poison scorpion tails. So yeah, I mean, just knowing that I'm about to preach something from chapter 10, it made me pretty nervous. Um, but I got my Bible out one day, and I read chapter 10 for the first time, and I remember closing my Bible after reading that and thinking to myself, I have no idea what I just read. <laughs> Even all the way up until this morning, I, I, I just have to confess, I've been very anxious about preaching this message um, and I'll get to more about that as we start looking at the text. But God's just definitely seemed to be working something in me this past week to try to, to personally teach me some of the same lessons I think he was teaching John uh, in this book, in, in, this, in this chapter. Even uh, a couple of our guys from our discipleship group went uh, to a camping trip this past weekend. And even on the drive home, I, I left early. I was planning to stay Friday night and leave Saturday morning, but I ended up leaving early. Uh, just to try to get back so I could spend time finishing the sermon uh, on yesterday. And even, even that drive home, Ethan was with me, my son, my eight-year-old, he fell asleep in the, in the passenger seat. And I'm just, I'm driving from, uh, coming into San Angelo from Mason, Texas, and this storm is brewing. And I'm, you know, I'm praying, I'm trying to talk to the Lord, and, and all of a sudden there's these clouds, and there's this, this sun that is amazing, and there's a rainbow uh, and you'll see why all those things are important. So just, the Lord has been very kind. Uh, just want to say a thank you to Alan and Billy, just their, their prayers and their support. Um, but anyway, so here we go. Revelation chapter 10. 
Um, and one more thing before we, before we start. This, this was also comforting to me. Um, I was reminded yesterday that, uh, that God, God inspired Timothy uh, to write about this um, in, in Timothy chapter 3. He says this, all scripture, so Revelation 10 included, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. So that, that, I think, should make all of us, myself included, perk up on the edge of our seats. Not for what Eric has to say to you this morning, but because God himself has breathed out Revelation 10 through the inspired writing of the Apostle John. And he has this particular word for this particular morning for our particular church and in order to be profitable for each one of your particular souls and, and my soul. And that's an encouraging promise, and, and I'm, I'm holding dear to that this morning. <laughs> um, so just to recap, chapters 8 and 9, uh, we spent time looking at how, how we were sobered by sin's consequences and Satan's schemes. And now in chapter 10, before the final trumpet blast is blown, so remember at the end of chapter 9, uh, this, the sixth trumpet has been blown, but now there's this chapter 10 interlude that happens. And before the final trumpet, that number seven trumpet's blown, God's going to assure his people that he is in control over all things. And his plan to redeem and preserve his people is unstoppable. So let's read Revelation 10. I've enjoyed standing as we've read God's words. Would you guys do that with me? Um, and then we'll read chapter 10. This is verse 1, God's holy word. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever who created heaven and what is in it and the earth and what is in it and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, we are grateful. Grateful to be gathered again this Sunday morning as your church. To fellowship with one another, to, to sing your truth into our souls. And Lord, and now for this moment, to, to receive together the, the preaching of your holy word. We ask, Lord, as, as we do every week, Lord, that you would bless the preaching of your word. Think of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And we ask you, Father, that you would use the preaching of your word to draw our eyes away from our circumstances, away from our problems, away from anything that might be weighing us down this morning, any, any sickness or, or broken relationships anything about the future or our finances or maybe some unmet expectations. Lord, would you turn us away from all of these things and would you even right now in your kindness give us grace to confess our sins to you, to repent of our self-reliance, our self-sufficiency, our self-centeredness. Any sin which might be clinging close to us, lift, lift our gaze upward, O oh Lord. 
away from looking at ourselves, and let us look to Jesus, the one who authors and perfects our faith. And Lord, as we look to him, pour out your Holy Spirit on us. Give us understanding. Refresh our faith. And that's all of us we ask, Lord, from every third grader in here to every precious senior saint gathered here. Renew us this morning, O Lord, with your strength so that we might be able to endure the race that's set before us. And we ask this by the power of the Spirit, in the name of Christ, for the glory of God. Amen. 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 Be seated. Oh, Lord, please. I think it's generally safe to say that Americans have a problem with waiting. I don't know if that resonates with you at all. Um, It's probably not news to any of us. We just don't like to wait. We don't like to wait in line at a fast food restaurant. We don't like to wait for two-day shipping packages to arrive. We don't like waiting for a YouTube video to load, and we certainly don't like waiting for a five-second YouTube ad to finish playing before we can watch our YouTube video that we're trying to watch. We don't like waiting for the pool to open this summer, do we, small kids? We don't like, in West Texas, waiting for it to rain. And as Christians, if we're honest, we really, we don't like having to wait for God to make all things new again or to wait for the works of evil to be destroyed, or for suffering to be over, or for the lost to be saved, or for Christ's kingdom to finally come. Even creation itself, Paul tells us in Romans 8, is in a constant state of waiting, eagerly longing, he says, groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Ever since Adam's sin in the garden, the world has known the sickening curse of having to wait And as Proverbs says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. God's people have always been acutely aware of this waiting. Adam and Eve, Noah, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ruth, the psalmists, the prophets, Elizabeth, John the Baptist, Joseph, and Mary, they all waited for the promised Messiah. They knew a future deliverance had been promised, that there would come a day when there would be no more need to wait any longer. Today, we know the Messiah that they waited for. He's already come. He came once and for all to pay the penalty for sin. But we still wait, don't we? Again, as Paul says in Romans 8, 23 and through 25, we God's people, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies, hoping for what we do not see and straining to be patient as we wait. We wait for him to come again, to bring final judgment and final redemption, for Christ to come and fully destroy the presence of evil and sin and to finally restore everlasting peace and joy and life for all who trust and worship him as king. We wait for his kingdom to come. But waiting is hard, isn't it? Why? (laughs) Why? When we know that the Messiah is coming and we know he's promised that, why is waiting so hard? Why why is waiting so such a discouraging thing? Especially when we can't see an end in sight for the thing that we're waiting for. Well, our passage this morning speaks into this discouragement. See, God has promised that there is coming a day when he will finally answer the collective cry of his people, the the, how long, O Lord? And he answers it in verse 7. If you look at chapter 10, verse 7, you can see there, I'm sorry, not verse 7, it's the end of verse 6. There will be no more delay. And then in verse 7, the mystery of God will be fulfilled. What what is is he talking about? John, this mystery of God being fulfilled. Leon Morris writes this, and I'm sorry I don't have any notes for you guys this, this morning, um, but this is a quote from a guy named Leon Morris, commentator. It says, God has one purpose through the ages, and it, one purpose through the ages, and it comes to this climax at this point. From the very beginning, he has planned to bring his people to salvation, and thus his whole purpose is coming to its culmination. It involves the judgment of evil, but it also involves the deliverance and vindication of his people. 
John's readers are to reflect that the mighty world forces of which they were so conscious, far from being triumphant, are about to be overthrown decisively. A purpose that God has planned before the world and has matured throughout all ages will not be lightly abandoned. The mystery of God will indeed be accomplished. So our first point today is that God convinces us of his competency, of his ability to act. The angel uh, is described here in this passage with Old Testament imagery. Let's look at verse 1. Again, it says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Think, Think about this imagery. Wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. This imagery it reminds us that God, of, of God and how God was with his people back in the Old Testament, protecting them against evil enemies, leading them through desert wildernesses, and providing for their every need. At this point in the unfolding judgment, we've witnessed, as we said, the six trumpet blasts, and now we're waiting. There's this pause, and there's the waiting of the seventh trumpet blast. And as we've seen, it, you know, these six trumpet blasts, they've not been pretty. Chapter 8 and 9 uh, and even before that, in the seals, it's just not been pretty. And I, I think if I, if I would have been there, seen what John was seeing, I, I think I'd have been scared out of my wits. It's an awful lot of devastation and destruction. And I, I'd imagine he'd be tempted to think, there's, there's no way these people are going to get out of this. It's not pretty. But God, in vintage Yahweh style, just as he had made good on his promises to so many of his people in the past to rescue them out of horrible situations. Just think of one situation, the, the prostitute Rahab. You know, God makes a promise to this prostitute woman who's lying to her own people in order to protect herself and hide. He, he protects that woman because he told her that he would. It's a similar this kind of protection it's, and, and this interlude, it's similar to what occurred in chapter 7 between the 6th and 7th seals. Because there, like here in chapter 10, God takes a divine time out. He breaks the action and the judgment being unleashed to take time to strengthen the courage of John's readers by reminding them of his covenantal commitment to fully and finally rescue his people. And as we saw in verse 7, if there's any question in John's mind as to who might be in control of all this mass chaos and destruction that's leading up to chapter 10, Yahweh wants to make sure John knows it's him. He calls the shots. Yahweh will destroy the wicked. He will save the redeemed. And although it may not appear like it, the redeemed will not be swept away and devoured along with the evil and unrepentant. Yahweh will preserve everyone whose name is written in the book of life. That was the promise he made to all the seven churches. Everyone clothed in white garments, everyone washed by the blood of the lamb. For every one of these, salvation will come. In verse 1, we see this angel. He's described as being wrapped in a cloud. The rainbow over his head, his face bright like the sun, and his legs pillars of fire. Remember, we, we've seen these kinds of imageries all throughout our study of Revelation. What John is witnessing here, it's otherworldly, and the poor guy, he's trying to figure out, how do I describe what I'm seeing here? So he reaches, when, he, when he's reaching for nouns and adjectives and similes to describe what he sees, he dips his pen back into the Old Testament. He describes this angel as being wrapped in a cloud and having legs like pillars of fire. And what does that make you think of? These descriptions are pointing back to the way the manifest presence of God was described as he led the Israelites out of Egypt and into the promised land. Exodus 13, verses 21 and 22 says this, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, listen to this, did not depart from before the people. That's covenant faithfulness. And the angel is seen with a rainbow over his head, which alludes to God's covenant promise made to Noah to never destroy the earth by flood again. Genesis 9 tells us that, verse 13, I've set my bow in the cloud 
and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. See, what is being revealed to John through the appearance of this mighty angel, it's meant to give him great comfort and courage. Just as God was with the Israelites, leading them out of exile, preserving them through the wilderness, bringing them into the promised land, we can be sure God will be with us. He will lead us. He will preserve us. He will lead you. He will preserve you. And God will eventually and surely one day bring all of his children home to the eternal promised land. But how can we be sure of this? How can we know that God will bring to pass all that he has announced, as, uh, as it says in verse 7? How can, we be sure, how can we know that God will bring to pass all that he has announced to his servants, the prophets? I think maybe John might have asked that same question. But, but look what John notices next uh, in verse 2 about this angel. He moves on from telling us how the angel looks to telling us how the, what the angel is doing. John sees the angel standing with one foot on the sea and the other foot on the land. What do you think that signifies to John? Well, this angel is signifying God's authority over all of creation, his sovereign rule. There's no place, and this has got to be a massive angel to be standing on the land and the sea, uh, but there's no place that, that God's authority and his rule doesn't touch, isn't, isn't claimed. Through this angel's physical appearance and stance, God is reminding us of his manifest presence and his covenant promises. So just a question for us here. Where do you need to be reminded that God is in control of your life, of your future, of your past? Where do you need to be reminded that you are not in control? That's a different thing than remembering that God is in control, <laughs> remembering that we are not in control. Or, or where might you need to be trying to, or, or, sorry, or where might you be trying to seize control over something in your life? And you need to hear God say this morning, stop it. <laughs> Stop doing that. You don't need to be in control. I'm in control. Trust me. I have a much better grip on this sovereignty thing than you ever will. <laughs> so where do, you need to, where do you need to hear God saying that? Or, or where do you need to remember God's promise that he will be with you through whatever it is that you're going through? That he will be there to lead you, to protect you, to provide for you, to not leave you or forsake you. Or maybe you're here and, I mean, obviously you're here unless you're watching from the live stream, but maybe you're here and you haven't trusted in Christ as the one who is in control of all things. And for you, with all the love that I can muster in my heart, that this is a sober passage for you. Because the, the reality, whether, whether you think you're in control or not, you aren't. There is one creator, and he's created this universe, and he has set forth history and time, and he's got a plan for the future. And as we see in verse 6, there's coming a day when, when there will be no more delay of his final judgment. His mercy will be expended. I read a commentator that said, it, and it won't be because, he, that he, gives, he gives us all these trumpet blasts and these seals, not because um, he just can't run out of mercy, uh, it's, it's because he can't, he can't run out of ways for us to keep rejecting him. <laughs> like we exhaust our ability to reject him, so he stops. <laughs> so if, if you have not placed your trust in the control and the competent, uh, loving Savior, Jesus Christ, hear him today call you. Young person, young child, growing up here in church, hear, hear Jesus say, I'm in control I love you. Hmm. 
You will never be able to remain in control of your own life and destiny. You will make a wreck of it. So turn to Jesus, the one who created and controls the land and the sea and everything in it. And and do this while you still can before it's too late. That seventh trumpet, it's about to blow. So repent, stop trusting in yourself. Place your faith in Jesus. So whether you're an unbeliever or a believer in Christ, all of us, all of creation needs to turn their eyes to Jesus, place their faith in Jesus, trust his promises, rest in his authority, and be convinced of his competency. Not only does this passage convince us of God's competency, he also wants to, and this is our second point, he wants to comfort us with his word. So we'll see this starting in verse 9. If you'd look at verse 9 with me. Let's read that together. So I went to the angel and I told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and uh, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> going to eat a scroll. So, uh, I mean, the scroll, it's, it's described as a little scroll. Uh, and that, that should make us think of another scroll that we've seen in our study back in chapter 5, uh, where the lamb was the only one who was able to open the seals that, the, that were on the scroll, keeping the scroll bound up. And that scroll, uh, one commentator said, it, it, it's the title deed of God's full uh, authority and, and claim on all of creation and all of redemptive history. And the lamb, he comes and he opens that scroll. So now this scroll is open and now it's a little scroll. And that could be a little scroll because it's a, it's a condensed portion of this, this full word. It could be a little scroll because this massive giant uh, angel is holding it and it has to be little because John's going to put it in his mouth and he needs a little bite-sized piece. Um, but whatever the, the scroll is meaning there, I think, I think the Lord is, is communicating to us that there's there's his word that he wants to give to his people. And so, so the angel tells John to, to take, to, I'm sorry, the voice from heaven tells John to go to the angel and take the scroll and eat it. And I just think it's funny. Look, look at uh, verse 9. So you know, the voice says, go take the scroll. And in verse 9 it says, I went to the angel and told him to give me the scroll. Uh, and then the angel's like, no take the scroll. So it's like, there's this little back and forth there that's kind of funny uh, between this angel and John. But I think that's instructive to us as well. Like there, there are, there's a, an activity and an, uh, a cooperation that we have with God's commands. We, we need to go and we need to take the scroll. That's what God's told us to do. He, he's not going to give it to us. He wants us to come and take it, receive it, obtain it, digest it, eat it, put it in your mouth. Like we always are telling our kids, like, don't put that in your mouth. Why, why are we telling that? Because they're going to get germs in there and they're going to infect their body. Well, he's saying, put this in your mouth. This is a good thing for your mouth. My word is good. It's good to be digested. It's good to be taken hold of. It's good to be consumed and devoured. Remember Jesus, he said, man shall not eat by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The psalmist described God's word this way in Psalm 19, that they were more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Is, God, is God's word like that to you? Do you I know I, I love sweets. <laughs> I know I love ice cream. I will put ice cream in my mouth if it's offered to me. But how often am I, am I neglecting to taste the word of God on a regular basis. To let it sit, to let it, let it percolate in my mouth. It's a sweet word. Are you regularly tasting the sweetness of God's word? Is that a practice of yours? If it's not, start today. Go home this afternoon before you go to bed tonight. Pick up God's word, read Pick up a psalm, look at a gospel, read, read God's word. Let, let his words be taken in by you. But there, there's something else that he says about the, this, uh, these, these words, and it's kind of odd at first. To take these words and they'll be sweet to your mouth, but it's going to make your stomach bitter. What does that mean? How could, are God's words... Are we supposed to believe that God's words are going to be bitter to us in our stomach? 
sour? Are you going to cause digestion? Like, I mean, indigestion? Is that, is that what we're supposed to take from this? Well, I, I think this quote by, um, by, what's his name? I'm sorry, Michael Wilcock uh, is helpful. It says this, Every Christian will agree with their testimony that the first taste of the gospel is to them one of great sweetness. Is that true for you? You can think back to those first days of hearing the gospel and, and understand your eyes being open. It's like, oh, this is the greatest news I've ever heard in my life. It's a sweet gospel. Saints of all ages have found it to be so. And he, he quoted some, some of the psalmists. But there is a bitterness in it when these words are proclaimed to the unbelieving world. For they speak of estrangement from God and wrath and hell for those who will not repent. So there's this sense in which these words of God, which are sweet to us as believers, when we realize or speak, when we speak these words to an unbelieving world and they reject that word, that, that doesn't sit right with us. It, it shouldn't. <laughs> So if it, if it doesn't affect you, then that's, that's another issue. But it should, for the believer, it should not sit well with us for our, our, the, the sweet words that we've received from the Lord to go forth and to fall on ears that don't want to hear it, don't want anything to do with it. That should, that should cause an uneasiness, a queasiness in us. And I just wonder, you know, Evangelism, it's part, it's part of the Christian life. It's the Great Commission is something that we all as Christians are supposed to be doing. Have you experienced that kind of bitterness? Just think of family, think of friends, think of coworkers, think of children who are not believers of your children of yours who are not believers. It's a bitter thing to think about the gospel sometimes, isn't it? Not because the gospel itself is bitter but because the, the fact that, that someone that you love does not receive the gospel. So that truth needs, needs to be something that makes us have an urgency to preach this gospel, to, to ignore some of the bitterness and go forth anyway. And that's our third point, that God commissions us to keep on preaching the gospel. Let's read verse 10 and 11. I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and tongues. I think this is a simple point. You who've received the sweet gospel of Jesus Christ, you go, you prophesy. You keep on going. You trust that God's with you and you keep on going. You, you don't give up. You don't let bitterness or a spoiled stomach keep you from continuing to proclaim the good news. That's what this angel is telling John. You know, you, you've said a lot, John, to all the people uh, so far, but there's more for you to tell. So eat this word. It's sweet. It might feel bitter in your stomach, but you need to proclaim this word. You must go and prophesy because there's a lot left in the rest of Revelation. And it, it doesn't get better. It doesn't get easier for the people who have not repented. Like we saw, there's, there's no more delay. A time is coming that's going to end. And so we, we the believers, we must preach this competent, sweet word of God to all who are around us. Amen. So to conclude, we saw that God pauses between the sixth and seventh trumpets, like he did between the sixth and seventh seals. And he does that to remind John and thereby all of his people, us included, that despite what John has seen up to this point, the mystery of God will be fulfilled. And that mystery of God, that's the gospel. It will be fulfilled. God's people will not be forgotten by him. Though they may perish, they will ultimately be preserved. Even though the final trumpet will bring with it the final and most intense judgment, and it will appear as though everything and everyone will be destroyed, Christ will triumph over evil. He will take back all that is rightfully his. He will restore his kingdom here on earth, preserving every single one of those whose names he has written in the book of life. So, so church, let us eat this word. Let us receive it. Let us own it. Let us submit to it. 
It will bring to us the same sweet comfort promised to John and, and that John experienced. And, and though many will reject Christ, and, and that's going to feel bitter in our stomachs, but because we have tasted the sweetness of the gospel, we must continue to proclaim that gospel message to all. So let us trust in God's competency. Let us receive the sweet comfort of his word. And let us continue to extend that sweetness to others, the unbelieving world around us. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the the opportunity that we get each and every week to, to receive your word, to hear your word, to receive your word, to consider your word, to be reproved and corrected by your word, to be equipped and encouraged by your word. Lord, thank you for this chapter and, and for the, the intentionality that you displayed to John in stopping all this destruction and coming down and looking him in the eyes through this angel and saying, I'm with you. I'm with you, John. And, and you need me to be with you because all that's coming is really difficult. Lord, thank you for that intentionality because that, that shows us your heart. It shows us um, the kind of God, the kind of father that you are to your children. Lord, it shows you the kind of heart that you have toward the lost and unrepentant that you would continue time and time again to have mercy for centuries, to display mercy to stubborn and rebellious people. But Lord, the comfort that we take as Christians, knowing that you who have promised that judgment will come, that that judgment is going to come, and mercy will be up, and we will finally be vindicated. Lord, it's a bittersweet promise to us. Lord, but we, we want to take time here at the close in response to this sermon to just turn our eyes to you, to ask for you to continue to do what you've promised that you'll do, to, to let there be at some point in the future no more delay, to let the mystery of God be fulfilled. Lord, we want to turn our eyes to you now as we sing and ask for you to do all that you've said you would do, to confess to you our belief in your promises. Lord, so receive our praise, we pray. Amen.